Hi, everybody who is here. Um, I am Carol Easterly. I'm one of the museum program coordinators here at the Kentucky Historical Society. Very glad that you are with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's see. Um, just uh, a few reminders before we get started with our virtual first Friday. Um, do please feel free to turn your cameras on if you would like to. We like seeing your smiling faces. Um, makes it feel like we're more, you know, together. Um, do please keep your microphones on mute though, just so we don't have any um, distracting background noise. And uh, I do recommend using speaker view, um, which you can, if you go up in the right, right corner of the screen, I think that you can change the view um, so that um, as Dr. Doan is speaking, she'll be sharing some images and you'll be able to, to see those really clearly. And throughout the presentation, um, please feel free to use that chat feature. That's the little conversation bubble down at the bottom um, to type in any questions or comments that you have. Um, we're gonna, well, we'll save those for the end, but I will communicate those to Dr. Grohn so we can have a discussion after she gives her presentation. Um, so uh, just to get started, um, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Grohn today. Um, excited to read her new book, which is just published um, last month by the University Press of Kentucky, uh, Simple Justice, Kentucky Women Fight for the Vote. And of course, this has been a year of commemorating that, um, that 100th anniversary uh, of women's suffrage. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, the planned events had to be curtailed uh, due to COVID-19, uh, though I hope maybe we'll get to revisit some of them in 2021. We'll see about that. But certainly uh, still able to get together like this um, and, and learn more about the Kentuckians who took part um, in that movement. And um, so just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Gome, she is Associate Professor of History at the University of Kentucky, so right up the road from me in Frankfurt. And she focuses on undergraduate teaching. She's also uh, was telling me that she coordinates uh, the internship uh, for the undergraduate students and focuses on career readiness. So those of us who have history degrees are very grateful for folks like Dr. Gome, um, who help us be able to actually get jobs when we get out uh, of school. Um, her, her research focuses on uh, questions of gender. She's also focused on um, Appalachia and um, medical history as well. Her first book uh, was actually about um, uh, Breckenridge, whose name I'm not going to be able to say. Mary, that <laughs> yes. uh, there are a lot of Breckenridge. There are. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, first director of the um, Frontier Nursing Service. And, uh, and then her second publication is the one that we are uh, here to learn about today, uh, about Kentucky women fighting for the vote. So without further ado, please take it away, Dr. Young. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for those of you who are sharing your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches today. Um, I'm glad to be here and excited. I, even through Zoom, this this is a good way to, to get together. And by now, I figure we're all old pros at Zooms. I've gone to a Zoom baby shower. I done happy hour, um, celebrated Thanksgiving through Zoom. We can do anything through Zoom now, it seems like. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here so you can see. Uh, the talk today will be based on my book, A Simple Justice. And like Carol said, this has been a big year, 2020. It may have gotten lost in all of the things that are happening this year, but this year set aside to really celebrate the, the victory, the milestone 19th amendment. And my book was, I timed it to coincide with that, that milestone. You can see there the cover and I made the deadline. I didn't wanna bring a book on suffrage out in 2021. Um, Anita, I think you're on the call. You understand that very well. So I made, made it in the nick of time there. Uh, but you can see my title and I wanna say something about that title for a minute. The, the question that I ask in the book is what was Kentucky's role in the uh, suffrage fight? Why did Kentucky matter in this story? And I chose this title, A Simple Justice, for two reasons. One, on just sort of the, the uh, most obvious level, 
Uh, it refers to the change in our democracy to allow half the population to participate, or at least in theory, half the, the, the population. Um, women who were suffragists and men too saw this as just plain, simple justice, allowing America to live out what it said were its ideals. Uh, women didn't want to be grouped with children and, and criminals and, to use the parlance of the time, lunatics. They wanted to be taken as uh, trustworthy people that could contribute to uh, making decisions. And so it was a simple justice in that way. Now, the second way I use this, though, I liked this as a title because it also serves, if you kind of read between the lines to look at some of the blind spots in the suffrage movement. Um, so I would say it kind of makes sense to add a question mark uh, to it also. Uh, women, while they insisted that the vote was a fundamental right, many suffragists balked at extending it to all. Um, when they started to think about how race and gender intersected, many of them got very nervous. And, and, and when we study suffrage, we very much have to continually be cognizant of how gender and race are working together here to guide this movement. Uh, it, there, there's a good reason why it took seven decades for women to achieve this goal. It wasn't anything that was simple. It was very complicated. Uh, you have people with different priorities, different, different strategies, um, and other issues here intersecting. It wasn't just a question, should women vote? It was much more complicated than that. So that's what, where the title comes from. Now, when we think of the 19th Amendment, I think our uh, thought, if we, if we just don't give it much, uh, if we, it, on its surface, it seemed like a great victory. And we celebrate every year, August 26th, uh, Women's Equality Day. We're celebrating this year, this centennial. We picture this being a joyful day for suffragists across the country. Hooray, women achieve their goal and all women could go to the polls that fall and vote. This is very much an inaccurate impression though. And I wanna start uh, here to show why that is inaccurate. Uh, for one, many women, millions of women are voting before 1920. Uh, and so that's something to keep in mind here. And I like this map. This is a map that suffragists used. They would revise it periodically to show victories that had been won. But with all of its, its shading and cross-hatching and symbolism here, you can see how women piecemeal win the vote in America. It doesn't all happen in 1920, not, not by far. Um, the first women in the United States to vote were actually in New Jersey, um, and that was as early as 1790. Uh, other women who were early voters in America, here we can give a shout out to Kentucky because Kentucky women in some very limited circumstances are voting as early as 1838. They're voting in school elections. You had to be a widow, you had to own property. There were stipulations, but a few women in Kentucky are voting very, very early. Um, you can see here, Kentucky is marked as having school suffrage. This is in 1919. Actually, there's a lot behind that story because Kentucky, even though it allowed women to vote in 1838, they later revoked that right. And by 1919 here, they've gotten it back. Um, but in some states, women are voting in all elections, presidential elections. That's why my students often get confused when we're talking about World War I let me show you there, Jeanette Rankin um, from Montana. She is serving in the legislature in, uh, during World War I. And students always say, well, women can't even vote. Well, yeah, but they're voting in a lot of places and they're electing women to national offices too. Now, let me also stress here, 
1920 comes and a lot of women still aren't going to be able to vote after that point. Uh, you have Native American women, for instance, um, immigrant women, uh, African-American women, large numbers of African-American women uh, are going to continue to be disenfranchised until the 1960s and the Voting Rights Act. So we can't see 1920 as kind of a, a all-encompassing moment. Um, there's, there's much more to the story. Now, if we're talking about Kentucky here and thinking about why Kentucky matters in the national story, I wanna start with this photo and, and, and sort of uh, interrogate this picture uh, for a few moments. You have this image, it's from January of 1920. Kentucky will be one of the states that ratifies the 19th Amendment. That's one reason why we matter to this story. We were the 24th state to ratify, one of very few Southern states to do so. So Kentucky here, significant. And this moment captured for all posterity. This is really an iconic shot here. Uh, Kentucky doesn't have a lot of good pictures. There's really only two pictures of suffragists grouped together, um, kind of suffragists in action. And so this picture you see an awful lot. And it's, it's interesting on a number of levels. We can look at it and we say, oh, what a, what a great picture there. It's fun to look at. We've got women wearing their fancy hats. Uh, we can look at their sashes and some of them have pennants there. Maybe you look at this photo if you're looking very closely at it and you notice the technology, the wires hanging down to run the electric lights. You have telephones there on Governor Morrow's desk. There's a fan in the back. I always remind students, it got very hot in Kentucky in the summers and everywhere you went, people were trying to to cool things down. So the fan there would have been very, very important a few months later. But this picture reveals more than just those things I've pointed to. If you know the story of Kentucky suffrage, and I hope you know, you'll read my book and, and learn more, suddenly this picture will reveal a whole lot more to you. Uh, 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 several scholars, me and several other people worked very hard. We had to try and reconstruct who all these women were and each of them carries to this scene a, a story of their involvement in the suffrage movement. And we can identify most of them now. I just wanna point to a couple of them, very important here. Uh, looking over the shoulder of Governor Morrow, the one who's leaning on his chair, you see her hands. That's his wife, Kate Morrow. She's kind of breathing down his neck. I think she's babysitting him a little there, making sure he does it all just right. She had been a suffragist and so appreciating this moment uh, very much. To her left or to her right, uh, the woman beside her, that's Madeline McDowell Breckenridge. Another one of those Breckenridges, Carol. Uh, a name very, very important in Kentucky history. Madeline McDowell Breckenridge helps to lead the suffrage movement in the state. She was also just a really um, energetic progressive reformer. She was involved in a lot of different causes. She wanted the vote so she could propel all of those, those uh, causes. Her story is a bit tragic. She's, she's going to get the vote. She's going to vote one time in November of 1920. It will be the only time she votes. Um, and, and I'll let you uh, read to, to know the end of her story, but, but kind of a tragedy uh, in many ways. We have other women in this shot. It, I could point to uh, women from Louisville, which were very important in the movement though not early on, Louisville will only later in the movement really take off as a place where suffrage activity is going on. But several of the women here, Carolyn Apperson Leach is uh, in this picture. Um, you have uh, the Castleman women who had been involved for many years in working for suffrage. Now, if we look at this shot, we see 
mostly uh, middle upper class women. A lot of these women were involved in other causes. They were club women. Maybe they had worked for temperance, uh, other reform activities. You will notice that they are all white and that's not accidental. The Kentucky suffrage movement was through its entire history, all white. So we can notice here who is left out. In some cases, people are left out because they had died many years before. Oops, I'm trying to get back. Somehow it's jumped forward. Here we go. Well, there we go. I was going to point to Susan Look Avery. She's also a Louisville woman. Uh, she was in her 80s and decided that she didn't want to retire into quiet widowhood. She worked for suffrage, uh, but she died before the 19th Amendment was, was ratified. She never gets to vote, and many, many women throughout this movement's history will be in the same position. So there are women that are missing from that shot because they had died before this happened. And this brings us to Laura Clay. Laura Clay is not in that shot, although many would be surprised uh, if you know anything about the Kentucky suffrage movement to not see her there. Laura Clay is the name that is probably most synonymous, it is most synonymous with Kentucky suffrage. And Laura Clay's story, a fascinating one that tells a lot about the movement in Kentucky. It tells a lot about the national movement, really. Laura Clay and her three sisters, plus her mother, all became suffragists. They're some of Kentucky's earliest uh, workers in this field. Um, some of the earliest in the entire South. Uh, they're talking about suffrage in the 1870s when very few people we're doing so. Now, there's a reason that these clay women, the clay girls they were often known as, uh, all become interested in suffrage. And if you know much about Kentucky history, I felt like that little sound effect needed to be in there because Cassius Clay, a very interesting, colorful figure, we could say, um, really helps to propel the suffrage movement because of his bad behavior, his behavior toward the women in his life. His daughters, his wife uh, watched, uh, well, he divorced his wife and that really soured uh, the clay women on men. Um, and they vowed to fight for women's rights. Um, the clay, uh, after he divorces his wife, they start the first suffrage organizations in Kentucky, one in, in Madison County, then soon after in Fayette County. And Central Kentucky will be really the epicenter of suffrage activity early on. Not only had Cassius Clay, he divorced his wife, he also brought this son back from Russia. He'd been Russian ambassador. Everyone suspected it was, well, he, he introduced the boy, everyone though, assumed it was his son. He really was a cad in many ways. And so Kentucky uh, benefits, the, the suffrage movement benefits from the clay women's frustrations and they'll become leaders here. Uh, Mary Barr Clay will be the first of the sisters to really uh, jump into this issue. Um, and national leaders see their interests. They see Mary Barr Clay growing interested in uh, this issue and they really they decide to capitalize on it because Kentucky national leaders recognized could be an entry point to the South to getting Southerners on board uh, and and the South really uh, uh, pretty conservative in a lot of ways religiously conservative suffrage would be a hard issue to sell in the South and having the clay women on board was very important to national leaders. So Laura Clay, uh, she never married. Uh, she was a very talented organizer, like all the sisters, but because she remained single through her life, that allows her to really devote time that some of her other married sisters don't have to, to uh, furthering the cause. So Laura Clay is the name. She's the figure that really 
leads Kentucky uh, into this movement. And she's going to serve three decades as president of the Equal Rights, Kentucky Equal Rights Association. She's also going to be an important national figure, uh, an officer with the, the organization that we refer to as NASA. Their name is a little cumbersome there, uh, but a national officer, she was auditor. She was well known through the country, certainly in the South, a representative of this movement. So there you see Laura Clay, she went all over the country. Uh, she went and helped states that were trying to get state suffrage amendments passed. There she is in Kansas. Uh, she really enjoyed the, the camaraderie, uh, uh, the, the excitement of those campaign, uh, uh, those campaigns. So going back to this picture, knowing what we know about Laura Clay and her leadership of the Kentucky movement, how essential she was to it, here we are back in 1920 and scanning the crowd there, a, a very, uh, it would have been to people at the time, a, a, a very obvious uh, absence here is the absence of Laura Clay. And Laura Clay, she's not there, not because she's died. She was very much alive, uh, alive and a bit disgruntled by this point. Uh, but she's not there because she did not support the 19th Amendment. And this was surprising to a lot of people at the time. It's surprising to us today. As an author, it gave me a really great starting point for my book. It's where the introduction begins. Laura Clay is going to Nashville to defeat the 19th Amendment. As soon as Congress passed the, uh, the Anthony Amendment in June of 1919, Laura Clay immediately, she feeds paper into her typewriter and taps out her resignation from CARA. She breaks ranks with the national suffrage forces and she begins to recruit uh, like-minded women to do everything they can to defeat this amendment. There's a picture when she's in Nashville, uh, she goes and she's crossing paths with all of her colleagues in the hall. They're all there. These suffragists gathered to get the amendment over the finish line and she's there uh, offering her services to the anti-suffrage organizations that were on the ground. And so Laura Clay, this really shocking defection from the movement she had helped to build. Now, let me point out here, Laura Clay wants to vote. She wants very badly to vote. It was her life goal. She believed women were men's equal in God's eyes. She was very religious and often used those kind of arguments. She felt very strongly that America needed to enfranchise women so it could live up to its democratic ideals. She, she looked around and she saw she was as smart as any man. She was as accomplished and talented. She deserved the vote and she wanted full equality. This was not about the goal for Laura Clay, it becomes about the method. How do women achieve suffrage? And she does not support the 19th Amendment. Under no circumstances does she want to vote if it has to come through federal means. The path to the vote, there were two paths. And this is part of it as we understand, okay, why did this movement take so long? Why was something sim as simple as women voting so hard? Well, there were two possible paths to the vote. Uh, you could go through the action of states, state constitutional amendments, each state on their own changing their framework of government to accommodate women or you could achieve it through federal action. The national, NASA, had long pursued both strategies. They 
basically figured they should throw everything they had at this problem. Uh, but their interest in a federal amendment had always been very weak, kind of half-hearted. They'd really uh, liked this state approach. For one thing, because it gave so much uh, leeway to different states, southern states in particular, if you wanted them to get behind a, uh, if you wanted them to get behind suffrage, a federal amendment was not the way to do it. And so by allowing state action, this gave every region of the country the ability, the flexibility to uh, pursue suffrage through their own, uh, according to their own goals. For many Southerners, a federal amendment, like I said, it was just a non-starter. And Kate Gordon's really the one we most associate with this uh, opposition to a federal amendment. Um, I, I mean, her racism is, is shocking. When you read her writings from the time, I, I, virulent racist is how she's often described. And that is uh, 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 probably an understatement. Um, Kate Gordon did not uh, support federal action for the vote. Uh, and, and the arguments of Southern, uh, Southerners were largely uh, because they argued that a federal amendment would reopen the wounds of the Civil War. It would go back to Reconstruction. When they thought of federal intervention, they thought of carpetbaggers and black rule, and, and it dredged up all of these worst case scenarios in their mind. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment, as the 19th Amendment was known, Susan B. Anthony, an abolitionist, I mean, the whole thing in their mind was dangerous and, and, and um, they, they did not support it. You can see here what the 19th Amendment says. Um, it, it's a copy of the 15th Amendment, except using sex instead of race. Uh, and Southerners, the second part really stuck in their craw, this idea that Congress shall have the power to enforce this article. They looked at that and they said, we will not, we're, we, we cannot invite the federal government into our affairs. And it's all about race here. States rights, they use that term, but that, what they're talking about is they don't want the federal government telling them who can vote in their state. And certainly if that is going to open the electorate, expand the electorate to include more voters of color. So Southern states, particularly Kentucky among them, really like the idea of accomplishing the vote for women through state action. That would give states the power to control things a little bit better. And NASA, like I said at first, is, is uh, in favor of this as well and really encourages that route. Kentucky suffragists go all out trying to get a state amendment. Um, the General Assembly in Kentucky is going to consider a state suffrage amendment four times starting in 1910. Goes down to defeat every time, but suffragists argued that they were making progress, that next time they, they, they were always optimistic that next time they would, they would see victory. And by 1916, it seemed like momentum was going in the right direction. The legislature, both houses had created women's suffrage committees. You had CARA's membership growing spectacularly. It had started out for many, many years. It had about 300 women scattered across the state. By 1916, you have over 16,000 members uh, signing on, uh, pledging support for CARA's goals. And so Kentucky suffragists say, you know, if we just have one more shot at this in, in, in 1918, that'll be our time for victory. We'll get the state amendment that we've been seeking. But in the meantime, the, the national NASA changed its strategy. And this is really due to the leadership of Carrie Chapman Catt. 
Uh, Kat had been president of NASA already. She comes back as its leader in 1916. Kat uh, is tired of being patient, you know, tired of waiting around. She wanted to see some action. She wants a winning plan that can get this uh, movement done. And so she demands that states fall in line with the nationals goals. All of these state campaigns that have been going on, trying to painstakingly in every state win suffrage victories, that was taking far too long. Kat puts all the energy starting in the fall of 1916, all of the energy of NASA behind the federal amendment and tells states, you can't pursue your goals. You can't continue working for a state constitutional amendment unless we in the national tell you it's okay. And Kentucky, she said, uh-uh, we need you to put that aside. It, it, a state campaign has very little chance of succeeding in Kentucky. We want you to shift your energies to working toward a federal amendment. And Laura Clay is outraged at this. She's horrified by this idea. You can see here Kentucky suffragists and Laura Clay is in the center of that picture with the umbrella. Um, they, they now have a problem. Laura Clay by 1916 was no longer president of CARA. She had stepped down in 1912, chose Madeline McDowell Breckinridge as her handpicked successor, but she was very involved in everything going on in the organization. You could kind of picture her looking over people's shoulders. She always held an officer position. She was a, a, um, a confidant for CARA leaders, sounding board. She threw in her two cents all the time. Laura Clay was an abiding figure in this organization. And when Carrie Chapman Cat says, you have to scrap your plan for how the vote will be achieved in Kentucky, she's ready to go to war with Mrs. Cat. Now, the rest of CARA, they aren't as concerned as Laura Clay about a federal amendment. Uh, and especially women from Louisville, I said Louisville comes in late to the movement, but really a lot of the growth of the organization in the 19 teens comes because of Louisville women. They're not gonna split hairs like Laura Clay over whether a federal amendment is, is dangerous. They say, if we can gain the vote, we'll take any way we can get it. And so this is gonna cause some real friction in the ranks of CARA. Now, let me say here, Laura Clay hadn't always been opposed to a federal amendment. And early in her career, you see her sort of not, not like uh, enthusiastically, but sanctioning, she's okay with the idea of a federal amendment early on. But when it starts to really become a reality, when it seems like this could be possibly the way women finally win the vote, she becomes strongly opposed. And I, I think part of the reason why she had always been kind of half-hearted about it was for one, she comes from an abolitionist background. She's not as overtly racist as a Kate Gordon. Um, although her racism, her, her, it seems to fester over time. Um, also in Kentucky, you have a smaller black population. And so some of these issues that are so important in the deep South in Kentucky are uh, less uh, uh, fearsome. But I think Laura Clay just never in a million years thought that a federal amendment was a possibility. Uh, she always believed that the Southern states, and there were enough of them to block any federal action on this issue, she thought that they would stand together strongly against a federal amendment. It would never succeed. And so when it starts to seem like this could actually work, she changes her uh, position on a 19th Amendment, firmly opposed. But her care colleagues are saying, well, 
we don't see what the big deal is. So the tensions growing in this organization. For a while, they're able to paper over them. Um, timing wise, you have World War I going on. You have the flu epidemic. Uh, that's kind of slowing things down. So they, they're able to paper over some of their differences. But in June of 1919, when Congress passes the federal amendment, Clay's worst fear is realized. Kara says, we will support the national. We will work for a federal amendment. And Laura Clay says, then I'm done with Kara. And she leaves the organization. Now, her efforts to defeat ratification don't work in her home state. In spite of everything Clay does to try and tank uh, Kentucky's ratification of the 19th Amendment, it doesn't work. She tries one more time in Nashville, uh, going there to, to work against ratification. And here we can really see, so, you know, the burning question with Laura Clay is, why does she break from the suffrage movement? And it's very easy to say, well, it's because of racism, pure and simple. And certainly her willingness to support anti-suffragists in Tennessee, at, in Nashville here, we see this full page ad that the antis, the Su Southern Women's League for the rejection of the Susan B. Anthony Amendment that Clay, she's working with this organization. They take out a full page ad in the newspaper talking about the Negro program, problem here. And so you see Clay's racism on display. There's no doubt that she sees the world through racist eyes. Um, and, and this shows us in very real ways how the suffrage movement was always about race as well as about gender. Suffragists, many of them wanted the vote for themselves, but they want to protect white supremacy. And uh, I was talking to Bill Goodman recently about the book. And when I used those words, white supremacy, he, he kind of uh, uh, questioned that, you know, the, the use of those ter that term, because we think of it in a modern context, they actually use suffragists, you see them use those words repeatedly and they, they're not trying to sugarcoat it. They argue how giving women the vote can counteract the black vote and, and show numbers to prove that this is going to protect white supremacy. They are using those words. And Laura Clay is as well. Laura Clay had fostered and grown and, and, and built an all white movement in Kentucky. There were a few Kentucky suffragists who played with the idea of interracial cooperation, maybe encouraging black women to pursue suffrage. Laura Clay has no interest in that and, and very firmly leads the organization to be an all white organization. So, so we can say that Laura Clay, her decision-making here is certainly influenced by her racism. I think there are other factors too. And I talk about those in the book. I don't have time to reveal all it. it I mean, we're human beings and, and humans tend to be flawed in, in ways um, that often are, uh, we're not proud of. And, and I think if you look at Laura Clay, she's a flawed hero in this story. So I encourage you to look at the book to, to learn more about what some of the other things that are, and I can talk about it in the questions, um, why other reasons why Laura Clay backs away from this movement. Um, but I want to say here how important the vote was. It was an important victory, but the story is just as important and understanding who was left out of this story. Uh, many people, I've been encouraged to see so many people working this year, not only to celebrate suffrage, but to interrogate it, to, to question what these suffragists did right and 
maybe where they fell short, racism, class division, self-interest, they're, they're all part of, of the story here. And it's an important story filled with lessons for us today, I would say. Thank you for, for listening there. Carol, I'll pitch it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gowan. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet. I, I look forward to it very much. I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna dig into the parts about, um, oh, I, or if, you, if it's covered in the book, the, the, you said you mentioned it four times. Um, the legislature, uh, the General Assembly considered uh, suffrage. And I, that, that's very interesting for me. Um, Cause I, we of course in, at KHS interpret the old state capital um, and um, I give tours there, or I, I used to, <laughs> but before the pandemic, I hope to again, but um, always looking um, for ways to incorporate those voices that, that are often left, left out of the narrative. And so I've tried to talk more about the suffragists who I know were there um, lobbying their legislators. Um, so I'll definitely be curious about that. Um, so please uh, share your questions with us uh, for Dr. Gohn in the chat. Um, Todd uh, pointed out he, said that he was really fascinated by your discussion there of the federal uh, versus the state approach, and he had not been aware of that, that kind of difference that, between those before. Yeah, you know, I think there's a part of us that thinks that if you supported suffrage, you were probably all in agreement. And they were in agreement about the goal, but the methods, they very much disagreed. You know, should we, should we incorporate temperance for Kentucky, especially temperance, the connections between temperance and suffrage, so important in a state like this, and a lot of fear among temperance workers that if they supported suffrage, that would undermine their, their fight against demon rum. And, and so the, these complications um, and, and certainly this division between women who are, are in favor of a, a federal amendment versus those who say, oh, no way, it only can come through state means. Um, one thing Laura Clay, she often said was, it, I think to justify some of her positions, she wanted the state legislature to give women the vote because she wanted Kentucky men to bestow that upon Kentucky women. She didn't want someone from outside the state to tell Kentucky men, you have to do this. She wanted it to come from the men in her own life and uh, you know other women, their, their own their own men folk. She wanted them to, to recognize and acknowledge their position in society. And so that was very important to her. I think that very personal story about um, Cassius Clay, you know, um, divorcing her mother and, and, and basically, I mean, I, I mean, really left them kind of penniless if I remember correctly. Um, well, uh, Mary Jane Warfield Clay, uh, Laura's mother, she, she was not without means. Her father, luckily, had set her up with a separate estate, had gone to uh, sort of extensive, taken extensive legal steps to protect his daughter and make sure she had an income of her own. And so she's not left penniless, but she had put a lot of work into the family estate, uh, Whitehall. She had you know, kept the home fires burning her husband's across the globe doing his thing. And she had overseen the remodel of Whitehall and he, he just, he treated her very badly in the, the process. And her daughters were inspired by that to, to, to That's go to such war. an interesting connection. I wonder, and how, I, yeah, I kind of wonder like how much did that go into Laura Clay wanting it to be about Kentucky men? you know, yes. recognizing, mm -hmm. um, and sort of, yeah. To get back at her father. So, yeah. That's, that's very interesting. All right. Well, does anybody else have any questions that they would like to add to the chat? All right. Um, I, I'm, I didn't see any, oh, there we go. Deborah. Um, Deborah says, thank you for your research. 
were there any African-American voices in Kentucky being heard in the early 20th century or soon thereafter? Good question, Deborah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I work very hard in the book to make sure to talk about all Kentucky women as best it, it some of the sources are hard to, um, I, I looked specifically for African-American women's involvement in suffrage, standing up saying we support the suffrage movement. And, and where I land on that is uh, in general, African-American women who are very involved in supporting reform efforts. Um, you know, they're fighting against separate coach laws and segregation, which is taking over Kentucky, um, all aspects of society. They're pushing back on that, pushing back against lynching, all kinds of issues that are upfront, very on their minds, uh, hard to ignore. They're putting a lot of their attention on pursuing those causes. And suffrage seems to have taken, at least by the 20th century, a back seat. Um, nationally, African-American women, organized women are speaking out uh, in favor of the vote. Very little direct evidence of Kentucky women doing that. Although early on, the first woman to speak about suffrage in Kentucky publicly was an African-American woman named, um, oh, uh, I had it and then I lost it. Um, can someone help me out? Was it, was it Mary Ellen Britton? Yeah, yeah, Mary Ellen Britton. Uh, Meb, as she was known in uh, the, the journalistic circles. Good job, Carol, you get a, a gold star. Um, she, it, she is speaking out as early as the 1880s. She gives a speech at a church in Danville at a teacher's meeting. And she very boldly says, women need the vote. That is the purpose of her speech is to encourage uh, women's inclusion. And so you have very bold examples like that. And you have a few white women in Kentucky who in the 1890s are saying, we need to work together to achieve this goal. This is necessary. This is the right thing to do. They're making, uh, uh, they're, they're taking steps to do that, going to African-American churches. It's always kind of paternalistic, you know, like we'll help you in, in uh, getting started in, uh, suffrage activism, but they, there are a few women that are doing that. Like I said, Laura Clay has no interest that I can see in that at all. And as some women that were involved in that move away from the state, any chance that Kentucky is really, this is going to, they're going to build an interracial movement that, that goes away. Um, in Louisville, there's some examples um, school suffrage, when women got the vote in school elections, they recovered that right in 1912. You see some Louisville women who are beating the bushes trying to get Black women out there to vote. Part of the problem, though, with school suffrage, the reason it was taken away from Kentucky women in 1902 is because too many Black women turned out to vote. So race, I, I, I deal a lot. This book is as much about race as it is about gender. Um, it's so important to understanding the story. When they got that right to back, the, the school suffrage back in 1912, wasn't there a literacy requirement attached to it? Yes, there was yeah. a literacy requirement. And so mm -hmm. trying to continue to weed out undesirable voters. Intended to disenfranchise there. Mm -hmm. um, so Phyllis uh, also has a question for you. Um, she says, having done some work on Eliza Calvert Hall, I'm aware that the Kentucky movement was very interested in women's property rights. Yes. So how much were there other issues besides the vote? That's a great question. Yeah, it, this really becomes about the vote uh, more specifically later in the movement. Early on, women, Kara, uh, its original 
name changes, Kentucky Equal Rights Association, uh, that was its second name. And that was to show the how broad this movement was, that it wasn't just about the vote because many anti uh, suffragists, you know, they fixated on that. Laura Clay wanted people to look beyond the vote to see all the ways that women lacked rights in society and property rights were front and center on Kentucky suffragists minds. Um, Josephine Henry especially works very hard to make sure women can control their own property. But other issues as well, um, things like the age of consent, that got a lot of women really inspired to work um, uh, on these issues. The age of consent in Kentucky was 12, which Kentucky women thought was reprehensible. Um, there were policies in place that made it so women didn't have guardianship of their children. If their husband died, he could put in his will that his children went to someone other than their own mother. And women <laughs> said, you know, if a mother's rights aren't sacred, there, you know, this is just unbelievable um, and, and, and cruel. And so Kentucky suffragists were working on all these other issues, really more so than the vote until later, uh, the 19 teens, they really start to, to focus more uh, on voting in federal elections. School suffrage, that got some traction. Um, they were working in Kentucky colleges and universities to try and open doors to women, to build a women's dormitory at UK, um, Patterson Hall, that was a big goal that they had and finally achieved. So, so yeah, this was a much broader movement than just the vote. Thank you. Um, let's see, and Deborah also, uh, oh, Jody, I, I think I, hold on. Oh, well, I skipped a couple there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Jody says, as a Louisvillian, I'm a little disappointed to hear that the women of our city were not as active in the early movement. Can you speak about why and what accelerated their involvement later? Yeah, you know, there was a suffrage organization in Louisville beginning in the early 1890s. And it kind of, it, it, it just didn't take off. Um, Susan Look Avery, I pointed her out. She was involved in forming this Louisville Women's Suffrage Association. You know, she had her finger in all kinds of different Pots. She was active. I mean, she was fighting against the death penalty, free silver. Susan Look Avery. She was. She publicly spoke out against racism. She wrote a pamphlet. Um, she titled it "Justice to the Negro," and so she had all these issues uh, that she was working on. And you know, I think what I, I, I realized looking at Kentucky different communities, every community, first of all, had its own set of circumstances, issues that were important to women, uh, but it also had its own collection of individuals that happened to be located there. And if someone moved away, maybe someone died. Um, Susan Look Avery always spent her summers in New York. And so they'd get fired up in Louisville and kind of get to work and then everyone would leave the city for the summer and it would die back down for about six months and they just really couldn't seem to get the traction and central kentucky had the clay women susan look avery's in her 80s other priorities to competing yeah it just it never seemed to click until around 1909 and ann allen has argued very very persuasively that the progressive movement, as it takes off, you have a lot of Louisville women who are progressive to their core. And they want the vote not because it, they want the vote for its own sake. They want the vote so they can accomplish other goals. And so it takes off then. Thank you. Um, let's see, Stephen also uh, has a question. Um, why were the Southern loss causers so concerned about the federal amendment, given how the Supreme Court had already so twisted the Reconstruction Amendment, and given the Southern states the clue how to, quote, constitutionally 
uh, limit black suffrage? Yeah, yeah, excellent question. I mean, they'd already invalidated, uh, undermined those reconstruction amendments. It's really interesting, those loss causers. Uh, there's a brief moment in the 1890s when the arguments, and Laura Clay is out front making this argument, that the South enfranchising women could be the solution to the race problem because it's right before the Supreme Court shows its stripes and they're not going to hold Southerners accountable. They're gonna let them do what they wanna do. But the moment before that, when it's still in doubt, when there's still a chance that maybe the Supreme Court's gonna shut down some of these, these efforts at disfranchising, yeah, it, it, women's suffrage is held up as the solution. As soon as though the Supreme Court says, oh yeah, you can do what you wanna do, then the suffrage movement has to change a lot of its arguments. And, and for white Southerners, I think, you know, the known is better than the unknown. And for them, the idea that expanding the electorate may reopen these questions. Okay, yeah, we've, we've answered them for now. The Supreme Court, the federal government isn't going to, to stop us here. But what if we, what if women gain the vote? Could that change everything? Could it reopen these questions? And so they just, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, but yeah, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge asked that exact question. What are you so worried about? Because the federal government hasn't stopped you yet. Um, adding women isn't, you're going to still be able to disenfranchise black voters. I don't know what you're worried about. It's essentially what, you know, and, and Madeline McDowell Breckenridge is much more progressive on races, race issues, <clears throat> excuse me, but she's also a pragmatist and she recognizes that to state or to call out racists that she's going to undermine her cause. And so she's very careful, but she tells black women, look, I'm fighting for the vote and I don't know as I want you to be out there on the front lines now, but when we win the vote, I want to make sure you're included. She, she basically says that. Um, Deborah had another um, question or comment. She said, I wonder if the efforts to repress African-Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century showed their effect by having so many issues to fight against that they couldn't even get to the issue of women's suffrage. Let me, can you? Do you want me to read that again? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so Deborah's comment, um, she says, I wonder if the efforts to repress African-Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century, that advent of Jim Crow that we saw, um, if that showed the, if it, that showed up, the, the effect being that they, they, they had could. so many issues to fight against, they couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I argue that, you know, they're, they're focused on the here and now. The vote is, you know, you only vote a couple times a year. It's it's less pressing than issues that you're dealing with on a day to day basis that de could determine life and death in some cases. Certainly, the you know safety of your family, their their ability, your ability to feed your family, those pressing issues took precedence and. Um, and, and others have argued this as well. Martha Jones has a new book on African-American women and suffrage. And she, uh, she are, it comes to the same conclusion. Right. Uh, Jody had to go, but said thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, all right. Uh, if no one else is going to add any questions or comments to the chat, uh, then I will go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you guys very much for being with us today. Um, I, we're not going to have um, a first Friday in January uh, of 2021 because the first Friday of January is New Year's Day and uh, you crazy kids will all be hung over. So uh, I know. who could blame you because it'll be the end of 2020. <laughs> but, um, we are going to be back in February. 
uh, the first Friday. Uh, then um, our speaker is going to be Dr. Allison Dorothy Fredette from Appalachian State University. Um, she um, has recently published a book called Marriage on the Border, uh, dealing with uh, ideas about uh, marriage, romantic relationships, and things like that um, in the border south during the Civil War era. Um, so some surprisingly progressive ideas that she um, uncovered, but I uh, figured February is a good time for us to talk about uh, romance and relationships. So hope that you will join us for that. Um, well, I'm sure we'll be sending out some reminders so you can get registered, but uh, I will see you all. Uh, if I don't see you or talk to you, have a very happy holiday, and we will see you in 2021. Bye, guys. And Dr. Gowan and Alan, if you guys will stick around for just a moment or more than. Okay. <laughs>